So the final speaker of this uh, session is uh, Adriana Figueroa. She is from Colombia, but she obtained her PhD here in Spain at the University of Zaragoza with a thesis focused on the study of magnetic nanoparticles, especially using synchrotron radiation techniques. Then she was a postdoc at the Magnetic Spectroscopy Group in Diamond Light Source in the United Kingdom, where she focused in understanding spin pumping phenomena and spin valves, as well as in the use of advanced X-ray absorption spectroscopy techniques. Nowadays, she is a senior postdoctoral researcher at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, where she is studying heterostructures that incorporate topological and magnetic insulators. So uh, please, Adriana, the room is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Miguel, for such a nice introduction. For uh, also for the um, opportunity to, to be here today. I mean, to to deliver this this lecture, it's uh it's, it's very nice. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Let's see. Okay. Now we can see your screen. Okay, great. Yeah, but uh, okay. Can, now, can you see the presentation now? Yes, it's in presentation uh, mode. Thank you. Excellent. And then you see only the presentation, right? Because yes, only that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks again for for the space uh, here for this opportunity. I'm very, very honored and very glad to to have this. Um, this um, opportunity to to deliver this talk, to deliver this lecture, it's uh, it's so nice to see. Uh, I mean, this um, community of spintronics in 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 Spain and to be part of it. And so um, I'm going to talk about ferromagnetic resonance, but uh, we have already been listening to to very fantastic talks about uh, magnetization dynamics and actually about this topic of ferromagnetic resonance. So you might uh, listen to, I mean, you might hear uh, very, very familiar concepts that have been already addressed and introduced, and even some of them have been uh, uh, going very, very deeply or into detail. Um, but I'll also, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll go um, beyond some of the, some of the concepts that have been already introduced because I'll go, I mean, I'm an experimentalist. So I wanted to give you an overview also on the kind of um, advanced techniques that we can um, combine with ferromagnetic resonance in the, for, for in, with the prospects of applications in a spintronic, uh, um, for, for spintronic studies, uh, spintronic research. So this is kind of the idea of my talk. And then, but uh, first, I'm going to start with an introduction of magnetization dynamics and FMR, just to re revise these concepts, and then to to I mean to to of course um, introduce what what we what we what we mean by by these by by ferromagnetic resonance. So I'll talk about the equation of motion, resonance condition, the Kittel equation that has been already introduced by Tim and and. Um, and Ferran, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to, to review and revisit all of these concepts. And then I'm going to go through the main points of my presentations, with, of my presentation, which are, what can we learn from FMR? What are the techniques uh, that we can use with FMR? And the information that we, that we can extract. I mean, we have already seen several examples and several uh, applications and and implementations of this technique in the, I mean, throughout this uh, this afternoon uh, or morning, whatever you are in the world. <laughs> so, um, so it's uh, it's very nice that uh, we are uh, we have already seen some of them, but I'm going to try to some, I mean, uh, revisit the review uh, what I think is is very relevant for for, the, for us as the spintronic community. Then I'm going to very briefly uh, tell you about how to model FMR because I'm not uh, an expert um, on this uh, part. I mean, I'm an experimentalist, but I thought I could introduce this part too for, for those who are interested in, in this, in this uh, 
in I mean in theoretical approaches for 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 modeling and simulating um, fMR. And uh, then I'm going to focus on these two parts, which is uh, how to measure fMR. So I'm going to briefly um, tell you um, some of the main um, uh, current techniques that are used to do so. Although we have already listened to these uh, from, uh, I mean, uh, about it from Tim and uh, Ferran. So it's, uh, it's, already, it's already been introduced. I'll try again to, to, let's say, recap them and then try to, to tell you a bit more details about it. And then my talk will also um, be, uh, I mean, have this, this, this uh, uh, relevant component about advanced techniques that can be combined with FMR to extract information that is relevant for, for spintronic devices or spintronic uh, systems. And in this case, as Farah uh, mentioned, I will tell you a bit more about um, techniques in synchrotron radiation facilities that uh, we can use for, for this purpose. Okay. So, okay, without further ado, let's let's continue with the with the talk. So with the lecture. Um, let's start with the magnetization dynamics. So it's uh, again, as Tim mentioned. Um, when we talk about uh, dynamics, there are uh, characteristic time scales of very of various kinds uh, of these dynamics that we can that we can explore. For example, well, and in general, they are they are determined by the um, interaction energies via the relation and uh, the, the, this Heisenberg relation. Okay, so for example, the fastest process is the fun fundamental exchange interaction. Which occurs at this uh, range of um, femtoseconds. Then we also heard about uh, spin, spin, uh, spin orbit uh, interactions, spin orbit coupling, spin uh, transfer torque that occur at this, at this range uh, between femtoseconds and, and picoseconds. We have some um, laser induced uh, ultra fast uh, demagnetization uh, that could uh, happen at uh, this range. Then we have the interest, I mean, the, the ones that are, we're interested in uh, in, this, in this talk, uh, which is about precession and damping. And then um, also uh, we have, uh, we will we, we listen uh, uh, about, for example, domain well motion, and then we will hear more in details about this. Uh, and we already, I mean, mentioned, I mean, listened to, to Ferran talking about the, the interesting uh, applications and the interesting uh, phenomena of spin waves, right? So as I said, we are, when we talk about spin dynamics, uh, we are talking about those uh, ranges of, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this range between the picoseconds and nanoseconds. And then we need to define in order to model uh, this, um, this um, motion, let's say, or the, this uh, phenomena of um, the spin dynamics, we need to talk about the spin precession. And the model that we are going to use is uh, based uh, on, I mean, we can describe it as an equation of motion. We using, I mean, from, from for example, from typical uh, quantum mechanics as this equation here. So it's the time dependence uh, variation of the uh, spin moment, okay? And then, um, what we can do is that uh, we define these, uh, well, we already heard from Baran that we define these, these, uh, this parameter, which is the gyromagnetic ratio, uh, which has a BGB value for a free electron. And then it characterizes uh, the magnetic moment, an angular moment of an atom or of a particle, or for in this case of, a, of an electron, okay? And then, in the macro spin model, the magnetization of, an uh, of, a, of a system, sorry, is assumed to be uniform throughout the sample. So we, we can define it uh, using this relationship. And then uh, we end up with uh, this uh, equation of motion, which is the, um, the variation of the magnetization uh, as a function of time. And in terms of uh, the magnetization and the uh, applied magnetic field, which is uh, the one that is uh, this, this system, this, this uh, magnetic system is processing around it. So 
and the this system i mean as 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 team uh, for that set uh we are modeling this as uh with this using this equation in motion which is in this case if we if we do not take into account the damping and we say that is the la i mean we, we define it as the lander uh, equation right and then but if we consider that uh yeah we consider that that magnetization vector is also um, uh, affected by, by the damping because that precession will uh, will is not infinite and then it will relax to along the same uh, direction of the of the uh, external magnetic field with uh, or we we don't I mean we don't define it as, uh, as a, I mean it's not only the external magnetic field but it's also including, we, we usually model it, including um, several components of, uh, of magnetic field, which so that we define it as an effective field, then uh, we uh, write this equation of motion as uh, including that effective field. But if we include the magnetic damping, which is uh, what, or the, 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 the damping, which is uh, um, making our system relax uh, to relax um, and align with the same with, with that effective field, then we end up with an additional term, which is uh, this uh, term suggested by Gilbert, and that's why we end up with this uh, equation of motion that includes both the precession and the damping, and it's called the lambda equ Gilbert equation, the LLG equation. Sorry about the pronunciation, but yeah, it's uh, the LLG equation. All right, and then. Um, as we hear from them, uh, damping originates from interaction. Uh, I mean, we could come from intrinsic or extrinsic uh, um, sources. So we, we'll see. We'll see later. Uh, we'll recap what what he what he mentioned in his talk, and uh, is uh, is relevant for for studying uh, diverse uh, different uh, systems. Okay. And then the damping is is, uh, is 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 I mean is model or is uh, the, the relevant relevant parameter that we are interested in is that alpha uh, alpha parameter, right? Okay. Then um, what we how do we so that's this is where we start to define uh, now a ferromagnetic resonance. So in this case. Now, if we take our system of this uh, time-dependent magnetization vector, and then we apply an alterna alternating magnetic field in the perpendicular direction of the uh, external DC or, or static field or that, that uh, effective field, then we, uh, we see that that precession of motion it's also will have also uh, an, a, a resonant phenomena. It will happen that with this, with these, um, with these conditions of this uh, all additional time-dependent field that is an external time-dependent field, and uh, usually in the radio frequency range, um, then we see that we end up with a resonant phenomena. Right? When well, it's uh, when we have the same um uh, angular frequency with, with the same frequency of the of our system so what does it mean it's uh the that's it means that uh when when the energy uh i mean the resonance will occur and the magnetization will process in the resonance frequency absorbing power from the alternating field so we already saw these 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 phenomena in the last uh, in the previous talks, and then, uh, well, how does this resonance occur? The energy absorption occurs when the radio frequency, as, as I mentioned, when this radio frequency is equal to the energy difference between these uh, these energy uh, frequency. I'm sorry, this energy difference. And between electrons of two levels. So what happens is that um, what we have um, when we have a, a this magnetic system in the presence of a magnetic field. I mean, this this we we have what we call the Siemens splitting, right? And then we have two levels, as we can see on this on this graph, right? And then that uh, energy difference 
uh, is uh, is defined uh, with the with that um, uh, but with the G factor and the Bohr magneton and then the external magnetic field that we are applying. And then it's also, uh, I mean, that that's the difference in energy is defined as a as this characteristic uh, frequency uh, h bar omega, right? And then if we excite this this uh, this uh, this system that we have this magnetization vector with this um, external uh, radio frequency field, RF field, at the frequency that is equal to that uh, natural fifth frequency of this, uh, that corresponds to this energy splitting, then we have a resonance process, a resonant process, and then there is an absorption, an energy absorption. So that's, that's what we mean here, right? And then what happens is that the power increases when these frequencies come near to each other, and then we have a maximum that for uh, a maximum that is exactly at that uh, uh, um, at that resonant frequency and that field frequency because it's, it's also dependent on the external magnetic field that we are applying. Okay, and this phenomena is what we call ferromagnetic resonance. Right? Okay, and then. Um, how can we model it, or how can we? I mean, what what else can we can we learn from this process of of fMR? So we can uh, understand. We, we can try to understand that re those resonance conditions. So I'm going to try to 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 uh, to play this this animation again. So this is very similar to what um, to what um, uh, Ferran showed in his previous presentation. It's a it's about um, collective motions, which are spin waves in our in our system. So, the condition for ferromagnetic resonance is derived using the microspin approximation, in which we assume that um, all spins in the system uh, undergo coherent precession, as what we saw on this on this uh, on this animation. But this is not really. I mean, it's not strictly true, and uh, in particularly. For for a couple multi layers or pattern samples, it, it doesn't it doesn't uh, apply to to all the cases, right? However, this approximation is very useful because it allows us to to find the resonance condition, and it, we we will see in the following how how we can extract this, uh, that or can we understand that resonance condition, right? So. How do we do? So we can start with uh, defining the radio frequency uh, susceptibility tensor, phi, right here, and then we know that it's uh, it it's um, it defines I mean the relation between the magnetization and the external uh, field, or in general it could be the also the effective field. Then if we solve the LLG equation, we end up with um, real and imaginary components of this susceptibility. That will have a Lorentzian uh, line shape, as so what we see in this in this graph, all right? So we have um, a real and imaginary part of the susceptibility as a as a function of of the magnetic field, and then that uh, that peak will correspond to the resonant field here, and as we see in this in this graph, all right? And then uh, we will see that that peak will have a certain um, uh, width. Which, uh, which is what we call the, the half width, I mean, we define it as the half width, half maximum of the resonance. And this is a very, very, very relevant parameter because it's related to the damping that we, um, we, are, we are interested in understanding or we are interested in studying as, as we saw on the previous talks. Okay. All right. And then, okay, so um, this resonance condition, can we also, uh, we can also understand it. From that, is, I mean, in order to find the dispersion relation, uh, to I mean that that relates this uh, this phenomena with the field and frequency uh, 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 dependence of, of the system of, of this absorption, right? So for that, as uh, we saw on Tim's talk, we need to determine the equilibrium conditions of the magnetization, and we need to minimize the free energy of the system, right? 
And then in order to do so, we well I have some some uh, some 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 assumptions here. For example, if we start with the cubic thin film system in which we have these uh, geometries between the magnetization vector, the uh, magnetic field, the certain magnetic field, and then we have a series of, of angles that we, that we define as the angle with the, the external of the external magnetic field, the angle of the magnetic crystalline uh, cubic is the axis of the only actual is the axis, the magnitudes of the magnetization, uh, I mean, and the, the, and, and the magnitude of the magnetization and the external field, and also the, um, the constant, an isotropic constants for, for example, for, I mean, we are here, we are defining this cubic system. So we have an in-plane for full cubic and isotropic constant. And also we, we assume that it also has a, an uniaxial, uh, an isotropy, an uniaxial and isotropy. So we define this constant. So if we, we end up with this relation that we see here, and then this relation will later uh, let us um, define the dispersion the relation that we call the Kittel equation. And this is, this is very relevant because the Kittel equation is what allows us to, um, to describe the um, dependence of the absorption of, I mean, of this uh, FMR, of this uh, FMR uh, system, of this FMR, um, uh, phenomena as a function of, um, of field and frequency. So here I'm showing, I mean, here I'm showing this uh, dispersion relation here um, as uh, including those, uh, um, that dependence with all these angles that I already mentioned in my previous, I mean, in, in, in the system, in the assumptions that, that, that we did. But uh, I mean, good news is that we can have a, a simplified version. If we si uh, simply say that we have an effective field, that is uh, this H uh, uh, effective field, and uh, and also a magnetization, an effective magnetization. All right. And now you can find more more details about the, this derivation and this this uh, this uh, modeling in this. Uh, uh, in these papers by, by Kittel, the Charles Kittel, this very, very uh, traditional uh, papers and traditional um, studies. Okay. All right, so uh, what, um, what else uh, I would like to, to tell you here is that we can see um, that, uh, I mean, in, in, a, in an FMR uh, measurement or in an FMR uh, um, uh, Curves in FMR curves, for example, we see this. Um, this this is the absorption. And, I mean, related to to what we saw of the um, of the magnetic susceptibility as a function of the external magnetic field. Um, and then and the dispersion relation is, which is what we uh, call the relation of this absorption uh, as a function of frequency and magnetic field. For example, for a cubic system, here it's a uh, iron thin film of uh, thickness of sixty-five uh, nanometers. We will see that depending on the on the direction, uh, on the uh, uh, yeah, the, on the direction that we perform these measurements, we will have a different uh, behavior of that key, of that uh, dispersion relation that can be that can be modeled with these with these uh, with these equations that we have derived. And so along the easy axis, we will see this uh, nice uh, shape. And then uh, along the hard axis, we will see that uh, uh, it, it displays this characteristic drop and recovery of the resonance frequency, which is caused by the realignment of the magnetization uh, along the direction of the field. And that drop appears at what we call the anisotropic field, right? Because, uh, I mean, it's, it's particularly uh, because uh, we are talking here about the, I mean, we are measuring along the easy axis of magnetization. And then if we measure it, uh, I mean, here we are showing measurements uh, in only two angles, but I mean, but uh, if we perform measurements in these, I mean, along uh, 360 degrees of this, of this, uh, uh, 
of the material. Let's see if I can do that. So um, say uh, along the different angles, uh, orientations, sorry, along the different orientation of the of the material, for example, of this uh, iron thin film, we perfectly see how this uh, resonance frequency has a fourfold anisotropy. I mean, it follows the fourfold anisotropy of the cubic system, which is iron in this case. So this is a very, this is beautifully uh, illustrating how this behavior of this uh, magnetization vector and the resonance condition is following this uh, fourfold um, anisotropy uh, 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 dependence here. Okay, so. Um, what can we extract from, from Kittel equation? So the Kittel equation is used to extract material parameters from the resonant field measures in, measuring in fMRI experiments. So, so from, I mean, to, to model this kind of, 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 of behavior, and then we can extract a series of parameters that are relevant to understand the magnetic uh, properties of our system, right? And one of those uh, properties is damping, as I, as I mentioned to you, but it was also mentioned by Tim this, uh, I mean, in his, his, his talk. So I just uh, collected what, what, he, what he mentioned in his talk uh, this, this afternoon or, or morning, I mean, two, almost three hours ago. And then he nicely described how these damping mechanisms uh, that can be uh, extracted from fMR measurements um, describe the dissipation from our system and then that we can have uh, extrinsic uh, damping mechanisms or intrinsic damping mechanisms and then he described all the different um, kind of mechanisms that can be that can be I mean that are are or that can be that can give rise to, to such uh, intrinsic or extrinsic damping. And then he provided also very nice uh, examples of, of them in, in their system. Okay, so what else can we learn from fMR? So I told, as I told you, we can learn about damping. We can uh, extract effective uh, magnetization. So we can extract fundamental properties of uh, these magnetization dynamics. Uh, such as the effective magnetization or uh, exchange uh, interactions, exchange stiffness and isotropy field. But beyond those fundamental properties, there are re relevant spectroscopic. It's, it's I mean, fMR is a relevant spectroscopic technique for spin uh, I mean, for, for studying spin systems, systems uh, because it allows us to extract uh, information about interfacial phenomena in structures or relevant parameters such as the spin mixing conductance. conductance. I'll, I'll talk about it in later, but uh, uh, it was also uh, mentioned before when, they, when the, the uh, spin pumping uh, uh, phenomena was, was described or, or introduced. Um, it also allows to find or to, to study spin to charge into conversion phenomena magnetization switches and then this I mean during this session we have learned and, and we have learned yeah several several of these of these applications or all these these uh, relevant information that we can extract from 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 this spectroscopic technique and then I want to to highlight that uh, we can learn uh, about other spin orbit phenomena such as spin pumping, spin orbit torques, spin, uh, spin uh, torque oscillators, uh, versus spin hall effect. I mean, these, uh, several of these have been already introduced, and but uh, it will be further discussed in uh, this Friday in these two talks by Sergio, Sergio Valenzuela and Andrew Kent um, in this session of, of, of Friday. So don't don't miss them because uh, they are they're going to be very relevant for and, and very related to to what we what we've seen today right and so I'm just to show you a couple I mean this just to just to show you what what are the phenomena that we are that, that I mentioned here it's been transfer torque spin orbit torque in which we use I mean uh, this uh, this uh, uh, fMR this fMR um, conditions or phenomena is, is applied for for several, several uh, spintronic applications. What else? So there are techniques, as, a, as, a, as I will go through later. 
So spin transfer torque, as I mentioned, spin wave and magnum transport, as uh, Ferran mentioned, spin, uh, sorry, um, time resolve uh, magneto optical peripheral that uh, also Ferran mentioned. So here I'm just showing uh, an illustration of, of how you can, I mean, uh, how you can do such experiments, which are based on pump and probe uh, um, uh, experiments. I mean, pump and probe uh, techniques or methods in which you excite your, your film and then you use, um, you, you take a look at the Faraday rotation, but this is time dependent so that you, you see how the magnetization uh, decays as, uh, as a function of time. And then you can uh, study this, uh, this, uh, this uh, decay uh, in order to extract uh, this, um, this um, I mean, information from, from the dynamics of your film or your magnetic field. And then other, other, um, other uh, phenomena or other, I'm sorry, other experimental techniques that I will introduce later are based on uh, synchrotron, on the use of synchrotron radiation um, techniques or, uh, uh, in, I mean, in combination with FMR, and I'll go through them uh, later. Okay, just to give you another example, I mean, just, uh, just to go a bit, deeply but not too much just to mention how fmr would end up in spin pumping so uh or like uh, how how we can study spin pumping in fmr let's say or with, with fmr so say for example that we have this system of uh, two metallic two ferromagnetic layers which are um, um separated by a, by a known magnetic layer and then we each of them ferromagnetic layers have a, the, I mean, there are, there are different, so they have a different uh, ferromagnetic uh, characteristics, ferromagnetic and, and uh, magnetization dynamic uh, characteristics, characteristics are different, for example, in terms of uh, different um, resonant field or, uh, or different behavior or response to, to, to radio frequency. So, and in this case, if we drive, one of them to to fmr if we drive fmr on one of the one of the layers the we will see that uh, because of uh, phenomena at the interface spins uh, will uh, drive out from one layer and then they could be um, they could be transported to the adjacent layer to the other layer and exert a torque on the magnetization uh, of that neighboring layer. So, and this is what we call like spin pumping. Well, spin pumping is, is basically the phenomena at this interface in which spin, uh, spin accumulation is, 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 uh, occurs at this, at this interface. And then, um, a certain spin current can be, can be induced or can be pumped to in, into these, uh, non magnetic layer. Okay. And then that spin current, if the, depending on the characteristics of this trilayer, in particular of this non-magnetic layer, uh, can uh, even travel further and then uh, affect the second magnetic layer. And this, how does it, how is that model? It is a model as uh, additional terms in, in the LLG equation. So we have the typical, I mean, the, the, the original precession and damping uh, parameters, and then, we have also additional terms of the spin pumping uh, parameter, which is an additional damping term. And then uh, we also can have these, uh, what we call the uh, spin sink or anti-damping parameter, because it's, it means that this, uh, this magnetization of the neighboring layer is also exerting some, some, uh, some spin current, is pumping some spin current, back to the to the normal uh, layer and then it could also affect again that original uh, precession of the magnetization vector in the in the first uh, film so just to give you an idea of how can this how the if this these uh, phenomena could enter into the into the modeling of, of this system more about modeling uh well so what do we i mean how do, how can we model fmr using uh, micromagnetic model, micromagnetic simulation. So what we do is to, 
perform solution. I mean, to 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 solve the LLD equation, it could be in, in, with using like numerical solution, so that we compute the time evolution of the magnetization. And how can we do that? So the simplest method to simulate a MR is to perform to perturb, sorry, to to perturb the system, and then to record the magnetization dynamics as precession is dumped away. So for example, we can use a pulse, in this case, uh, a time dependent uh, pulse. And in this case, uh, we're using a sync pulse that has this shape and with all that decays uh, in time as well, because of, I mean, that's how we, we model the damping. And then uh, this is what we use to per perturb our system. And then we see how is the, how is the response of the, of the, of of our of our of our material. So what we see is that the resonance frequencies uh, and corresponding modes uh, to, to related to these to this perturbation will be extracted by performing the Fourier transport of the recorded data. And so uh, when we perform the, the Fourier transform, we, we end up with a characteristic resonance frequency. And then if we compare, say for example here, um, I'm showing examples of uh, results for a thin cobalt uh, iron film with an external magnetic field. Uh, and then, I mean, we're comparing simulation and experimental uh, data for that film. And here is, well, the, this is in terms of the absorbing power uh, as a function of frequency, but here in terms of the dispersion relation along the easy axis and the hard axis. And, and I mean, this is this is uh, very nice because it it also allows you to to extract information relevant information about the the parameters that you're interested in in studying in your in your system, and then we will le learn more about it. Uh, I mean about uh, micromagnetic modeling and and not only in terms of uh, of of of, of fMR, but I mean related in general to spintronics in this talk uh, on Friday as well by Yu Bong Kim, right? So stay tuned. <laughs> right. Okay, let's continue now. So this, that's uh, that's uh, enough for for um, modeling and, and the equation. Let's go to the experiments, all right? So let's, uh, yeah, originally and traditionally, as, as Tim already mentioned, uh, he, he described that uh, at the beginning, or like um, in, 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 in traditionally, fMR was measured using resonant cavities because it was uh, like the simplest. And I mean, it was the technology that was uh, was uh, first implemented for, for running these experiments. So, but it has some drawbacks uh, because um, resonant cavities are designed for for only one frequency. So, for example, the typical Mm, bands uh, that were used for these cavity scores around 9 gigahertz, which is which correspond to the X band. And here I'm showing a, a picture of, a, of a, one of, of these cavities that are, is, is, is introduced into a, a magnet to say, for example, to electromagnetic coils to that, that apply the external magnetic field and then the radio frequency is uh, or is supplied by a microwave source uh, that is uh, that is guided to using a a, a weight gap to to the to the cavity. But nowadays um, we are using more and more. We're more we're more interested in in running experiments using uh, broadband uh, from magnetic resonance, in which we can extract the information uh, at different frequencies. Not only, I mean, it allows us to to sweep not only the the um, the the magnetic field, the external magnetic field, but also the um, uh, excitation frequency of the radio, of the microwaves. So, in order to do so, um, as as it was mentioned already, um, the typical um, setups or the typical instruments that are used are Coplana workouts that deliver the microwave field uh, above the signal line. So a typical coplanar waveguide is illustrated here, um, where the uh, microwave is, is, uh, is written to, through the signal line. And these are the, the line, I mean, the, the, the typical um, 
I mean, line field, or field lines for how the electrical and magnetic field are in these in these systems. We uh, place our sample on top of it, and then we apply an external magnetic field by introducing the coplanar wave guide with a sample in a uh, in a in a I don't know in a a uh, a couple of coils that help from coils, coils or an electromagnet, right? And how can we uh, drive, I mean, deliver those, um, that radio frequency, that AC, that AC uh, uh, field? We can use, for example, a vector network analyzer. And then in this case, uh, what we do is to measure the transmitted or reflected power and the, I mean, using I mean, the, the, that is the driven uh, by this uh, analyzer, and then um, it's it's it's, the, it's very nice because it's it's it's, it's a it's a very powerful piece of equipment. But as Tim mentioned, it's it's expensive, <laughs> and even it's expensive if you if you want to to go to very high frequencies. Uh, but these uh, setups uh, allow for frequency field and some of them even for angle sweeps if you have, for example, a vector uh, magnet or a magnet that allows you to apply a magnetic field in different uh, orientations. What else can we use? I mean, what other setups can we use? So in terms of also of uh, broadband um, for magnetic measurements, um, nowadays, um, some of the, I mean, you might be familiar with this uh, piece of equipment, which is the physical property measurement system, the PPMS. And then um, quantum design has a, a, a collaboration with this, um, with this, um, with this company called the Nanoscope, Nanosc, Nanoscope, where the, and they, the, they developed this uh, nice uh, setup to perform fMR measurements, and not only fMR measurements, but broadband uh, fMR measurements in this uh, in the PPMS. So we can use, I mean, it's, a, it's an external probe that can, that can be introduced into the PPMS. And then with this, we can, we can use, I mean, we characterize our samples for, for fMR. All right. Um, then I'm giving you here an example of um, DNA from our measurements on multi-layer systems. So again, we have a system of uh, two ferromagnetic layers separated by a non-magnetic layer. And then uh, what we see in, I mean, the spectra that we see in, in, uh, in DNA from our has these uh, characteristic shapes for, so for, so with the, what we see the absorption of the, I mean, the power absorption for the two uh, modes, one for each of the layers. So the two layers that we have here is one is uh, nickel iron and the other one is cobalt iron. And then in the dispersion relations, we, we see this, 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 this map that we have here. And then the nice thing is that we can, uh, I mean, we can uh, study this, the, the behavior of the FMR for the different, uh, for the different uh, um, modes or for the different uh, layers. But in what, what we do in, in DNA FMR is that we, we end up with these kind of measurements in which we have, um, um, we, we have both um, contributions of the, of, the, of the two layers. So we cannot really distinguish between one of the two, I mean, we know that one, which one corresponds to the other one because we know what the anisotropic uh, characteristics is for, for one of the layers. And also because for example, for in this case, for the nickel iron, uh, it was uh, grown, uh, it's, it's polycrystalline, so it doesn't really have a, a definite anisotropy. So we know that it doesn't change with angle, whereas the, the cobalt iron layer does change with angle. And in this case, we were interested in, in studying the spin pumping phenomena from one layer to the other. So with the DNA FMR, we were able to extract information about the spin mixing conductance uh, by uh, analyzing the uh, this damping uh, corresponding to the spin pumping uh, damping as a function of the layer thickness. So we, we were able to, to, to obtain information about these, these relevant uh, parameters. However, 
uh, we were not uh, able to know whether that uh, spin current or that, that 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 spin those spins that were pumped from one sample, I mean, from one layer to the other, were were reaching the other the other layer. For that, we needed to to access information in a more selective way, and this is where these advanced characterization techniques come into play. Uh, which characterization techniques or which uh, advanced techniques? Well, those, for example, that we can use uh, at synchrotron radiation facilities, right? So for those, I mean, I know that in the audience, might, there might not be uh, many uh, users of uh, synchrotron radiation techniques. So just to give you a brief, a brief introduction or a brief uh, overview of what, what this is, um, and synchrotron radiation facilities are uh, are um, uh, particle accelerators in which we have electrons circulating in a storage ring. And then we when we deflect those electrons from their trajectory using uh, magnetic fields, for example, we, uh, they, they emit uh, what we call synchrotron radiation. Synchrotron radiation is uh, light, let's say, or, or electromagnetic radiation. That is, uh, that is uh, highly intense, bright, continuous, and tunable, and ranges from the infrared to the gamma rays. And many, many, uh, many techniques that we use at these uh, facilities make use of, for example, of uh, or typical use of X-rays. They could be uh, in the, I mean, the soft uh, X-ray range or the hard X-ray range. It depends on the application, depends on the technique. That we are that we are using or that we are interested in, and then uh, light can be used to investigate phenomena at different time and length scales using that 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 uh, that I mean using this radiation. We will learn more about it uh, in the talk by Lucia uh, this Friday at uh, at six p.m. Uh, Central European time, right? So the different experimental techniques that we can that we can uh, use uh, they, we can use diffraction, scattering, absorption, imaging. Uh, so Lucia uh, will probably focus on uh, on imaging techniques. I can tell you a bit about uh, X-ray absorption, for example, because it's the technique that I'm that I'm going to discuss in the following. So X-ray absorption spectroscopy uh, is, um, is 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 uh, is a technique in which the, we shine uh, X-rays uh, on our sample, and then um, that uh, X-ray photon um, excites um, um, uh, electrons, colored electrons, from the these uh, levels. I mean, from the coarser level to the continuum, right? And then what ha what happens is that uh, there are characteristic absorption edges. For almost all elements in 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 the spectral region, so it's a technique that uh, is based, as I said, on core electron excitation, and because of those characteristics, um, characteristic absorption edges, they um, it's element site and shell specific. So it's very specific in which that so that we can use this technique to study uh, what happens in an element selective way in terms of uh, structural and electronic and magnetic uh, uh, properties of, of our sample. In terms of magnetism, which is what, uh, what we're interested in, we define a, a technique based on X-ray absorption, a spectroscopy, which is called X-ray magnetic circular dichroism. So it is, um, in this case, what we say, what we see is that uh, such uh, X-ray absorption, if we use um, circularly polarized light, we will have uh, a spin-dependent absorption of those photons. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that uh, because of dipole selection rules, we will have um, only uh, allow, I mean, we have uh, only some uh, allowed transitions be um, that uh, flavors the excitations of uh, spin up or spin down electrons depending on the helicity of the photons and that we are um, of those x-rays that we are shining our sample on. 
so that we will have if we, we will have a spectra or like um, x-ray spectra um, that has a different intensity depending on that helicity and then uh, depending on the spin uh, uh, state of all the atoms that are on those, those four level and also depending on the empty states of the uh, final uh, states that we have uh, that we are that we are probing so that uh, with this if we if we make the difference between those sex reabsorption spectrum we will end up with a dichroic signal that um, it's um, proportional to the magnetic state of those atoms that we are of those uh, sorry of those uh, elements that we are probing with our X-rays, and then um, that that uh, magnetic character of that of this of this uh, material. I mean that those those signals that we are that we are getting from these X-ray absorption uh, uh, spectra are proportional to the spin moment and the magnetic moment, and they are related to. To through the um, what we call the magneto optical sum rules, which are these equations that we have here that correlate these integrals that we have from this spectrum. Right? And okay, so this is uh, the nice thing about uh, uh, about uh, X-ray uh, X-ray techniques that we can use at the synchrotron radiation in order to extract uh, information about the magnetic character of our of, of our material, but if we combine that with fMR, we can even go farther because we can also probe the magnetization dynamics of these different layers, as I told you, say on, on that system that I told you, that I showed you, in which we have uh, this trilayer. We can use uh, we can use that technique to probe that magnetization dynamics by combination of this uh, XMCD technique with fMR. How do we do that? Is uh, we we perform a spe spe stroboscopic uh, XMCD measurements, in which we we uh, synchronize the arrival of the X-ray pulses coming from the synchrotron radiation uh, facilities from the from the source, uh, to probe this magnetization precession uh, of this precession of the magnetization vector um, of at each point of, in cycle. So. This is this is what we call this spectroscopic, no, sorry, stro stroboscopic uh, measurement. So what we see is that um, we um, at that delay, I mean, we we will see, we will we will shine our, our X rays to our sample to to probe that that precession uh, cone of the of the of our magnetization vector. And then we can track down that precession uh, very nicely. So these are the kind of, of, um, of um, curves that we end up with, where we see, I mean, the, the, what we measure is the dynamic XMCD signal. So we not only have uh, information about the, the amplitude of precession, but also uh, about the phase of precession. So in this case, for example, we are just probing the magnetization precession for iron cobalt in uh, tuning the energy to the iron and cobalt, but since they are part of the same film, they are just, uh, they are in phase and everything, I mean, processes very, very nicely in the same way. And then for, for example, for a nickel uh, iron layer here, if we tune it to, to nickel, if we perform measurements at the different uh, external field, we can um, track down that precession, uh, track, that, track down that precession, but across the resonance of uh, of the of the of that layer. So this is very nice because we can see how the not only the amplitude of precession increases when you reach the resonance, which is around this 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 uh, this uh, value of field of, of fourteen millitesla. But also you see the change of phase here, which is also very interesting. And it's interesting for some, for some um, applications, for some, some, some studies, for some investigation. For example, if you have tri-layers as, as the one that I showed you before, in which you have uh, two ferromagnetic layers separated by, the, by, the, by a non-magnetic uh, film, then you can use this technique that is called X-ray detected fMR or XFMR 
to selectively uh, measure the magnetization dynamics, to probe the spin currents in, in these non-magnetic layers, and to detect the excitations of uncompensated spins. For example, here is to detect the, these, uh, these, uh, these excitations in this uh, cobalt uh, uh, oxide here, which is an antiferromagnetic insulator. Um, depending on the shape that you have of the phase and field curve, you can you can study the interlayer coupling. If you could understand if it is uh, of the nature of that coupling, if it is static or dynamic, the coupling between the two the two layers, and so on. So there there are lots of possibilities in this in this in this uh, technique. So I'm going to skip some of the other results that I was going to show you, um, but. If you have questions, I can I can answer to them because I, I think I'm running out of time. So just to give you, I mean, this is the take home message from this lecture that just to tell you that fMRI is a well established spectroscopy technique to study magnetization dynamics, as we have seen all through this uh, this uh, this session of today. Um, it provides relevant information on the spectronic properties of non-structured materials. Um, also on thin films and devices. And the combination of fMR with, uh, with advanced uh, techniques allows for exploitation of the capabilities of, of fMR. And is, this is very, very relevant for the field of spintronics. And this is what I wanted to, 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 to tell you today. I wanted to, to give you that message that this is this technique of fMR in combination with, with advanced uh, techniques is very powerful for the field of spintronics. And I think the prospect and the future will 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 continue and will 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 progress in this direction. So with this I finish and thank you very much. I'm happy to 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 answer your questions in this I don't know how, how long we have but uh, I apologize for 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 being a bit late. Thank you. Thank you very much Adriana. Uh, please do not apologize mm -hmm. at all. Uh, I'll be um, moderating the questions as okay, Josmiel had uh, also to go a bit earlier today. So uh, thank you very much for the effort and because being the third on a row talking about um, similar uh, questions is, is not is not easy. Thank you very much. Paul, yeah, it was not easy, but I, I was trying to recap things the, from the previous okay. time, so yeah. In any Thank case, I, I think it has been a, a very nice and very clarifying uh, talk. Thank you very much, Thank Adriana. You. We have we have already several several questions. Okay. Uh, Zach, uh, we have time. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, um, First question by Sak uh, S A K uh, tells uh, thank you. Can you please elaborate about uh, the different dumping terms in a spin in a spin pumping equation? Mm. Yeah. So you you show the the spin pumping equation and uh, yeah, you, if you can elaborate on the dumping terms on the different dumping terms appearing in the in the equation. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I showed you, I showed them very, very briefly uh, because I, I mean, it also depends on what you're modeling and it depends on, on, I mean, on the phenomena that you're modeling. So here I just wanted to bring this, uh, this um, example of some of, uh, in the case of spin pumping, for example, here. So in, but is, this is particular for this case when you have a tri-layer composed of two ferromagnetic uh, materials that, uh, and then uh, separated by the non-magnetic material. And then what you're, what you're modeling here is, uh, is that you, um, you add these two additional dumping terms, one that corresponds to the dumping term and of the spin current that is being pumped or the spins that are being pumped from the magnetization layer from, I mean, from, from, from the ferromagnet one to the uh, non-magnetic layer. And then you, uh, the second part, the second uh, term is this damping term that uh, is exerted back from the 
second ferromagnetic layer to the non-magnetic um, to the non-magnetic layer that mm -hmm. uh, is affecting the first uh, magnetic layers because as we can see here in this in this uh, figure, I, I think you see. I, I don't no, know. You, you, oh, you are not. Don't see. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, as you can see here, yeah, sorry, because I, I, was show, I was showing the pointer, but I, I didn't have the pointer here. Okay, right. so as you can see, yeah, I'm sorry. So as you can see here, this is the equation of motion of the magnetization vector. No, 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 vector. Uh, you, you are not showing your screen. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, oh, you are not okay. showing your screen. Okay, again, we have this vision. <laughs> Okay. Don't worry, Adriana. I did worse than that the first day. <laughs> How about I now? My, I ran my full presentation of the course without. Uh... Oh, I remember. <laughs> oh, uh, but yeah, I remember that. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Can you see the presentation now? And the yeah, pointer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you. sorry. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I was pointing you know, all the time. So, yeah, sorry. So I was showing this, uh, this, uh, this. Um, yeah, I was telling that we have this equation in which we are modeling the magnetization, uh, the, the precession of the magnetization on the ferromagnetic layer one, and uh, we are adding these two terms for spin pumping um, that include these damping terms, uh, these uh, these uh, damping terms here. But the first one is the one that corresponds to the spin to the spin current or the spins that are being pumped from the ferromagnetic layer one to the non-magnetic layer. Uh, so that is like uh, uh, let's say uh, energy that is being uh, driving our it's this energy that is driving out. So it's, it's losses that we have here, and then the second part is uh, the, the second term is how that uh, spin current is affecting the magnetization of your of this of this uh, second ferromagnetic layer. And then the, because the second ferromagnetic layer is also um, um, uh, processing, this magnetization vector is processing, it also exerts some some um, some torque some some it's it's pumping some spin current to the to the non magnetic layer, and that uh, is affecting at the same time is affecting the first layer, right? So that's why it has a different sign than the than the than the first one, and this one is what we call it. it it's um it's uh it's we call it spin sink or anti damping. Because it's uh, in this case the way it affects the magnetization uh, dynamics of the first ferromagnetic layer is in the way that this uh, this uh, this magnetization vector is absorbing an energy. So that's why we call it anti damping. Right. I hope it's clear. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. There is a, another question. Uh, this is a technical question by Sukanta. How does ferromagnetic resonance signal, imaginary or real, of a ferromagnetic sample uh, in out-of-plane orientation depend upon the width of signal line of the uh, uh, coplanar uh, waveguide at a constant mm. power of gigahertz frequency? Is oh. there any relationship mm -hmm. between ferromagnetic resonance signal and signal line width of the of the coplanar wave uh, guide? Well, um, I don't remember if there is a, 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 a relation or a direct relationship with the with these uh, <clears throat> with the width. What I know is that it's important to design your coplanar wave guide so that. Um, the width of the signal line is uh, thin enough to deliver enough power on your sample. So the thinner the signal line, the stronger the power that you can apply to your to your system. So that is how it affects uh, your system. So if your system, for example, is, is quite weak and you cannot really see um, a, a, a well-defined uh, fMR signal, um, it's best to use a thinner uh, signal line 
so that you deliver a uh, larger power on your signal. And then in, in terms of the orientation of the out of plane or in plane, um, I don't remember the, 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 um, the, um, how it, how it is, uh, the, the, uh, dependence on that, I'm afraid. But, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very relevant to, to, to design the, your coplanar wake so that it delivers much, uh, higher power. Okay, thank you. The Another question by Marina Ferreira tells, uh, Hi Adriana, thank you for the very interesting talk. Is it also possible to use XMCD to study spin pumping by probing the absorption edges of the non-magnetic spin sink material instead of the ferromagnetic one, the one in the ferromagnetic resonance? Definitely, and question. it has been. It's a very good question, it's very relevant, and it has been done. So people in Berkeley have uh, performed that. I don't think I have uh, the reference here, but okay. In this reference, they do. It's a nice review of some of the um, of the of the recent um, uh, systems that had been used to, and that had been exploring that. So um, this group by, um, by it's, it's a group in Berkeley, in the University of Berkeley, where they performed these experiments in, at the ALS in, in, in Berkeley. Um, they, what they did was to use uh, copper, oh no, manganese. They use manganese as, a, as, a, as a, an interlayer between two, two ferromagnetic uh, materials. I think it was also Permaloy and cobalt iron, and then they tuned the energy to the manganese, and they were able to see how these um, sample, I mean, how this layer that didn't show a static at some city, because I mean, what you can you you see that I mean, we we with XFMR we measure a dynamic signal uh, of XFMR, I mean, a dynamic signal of XMCD, and then. What they showed is that uh, by tuning or by uh, when you measure ecstatic XMCD, you don't have a, 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 a let's say a, a signal from the magnetic from the manganese or from the interlayer. But then when you measure dynamically at the manganese layer at the manganese edge, I think it was manganese. And when you measure at that edge, you do see dynamics. So it's it's very powerful because you see the um, the results of, uh, of uh, I mean, it's a, it's a direct way of measuring the spin, the, the spin current in, in this material. So it's, it's a very, it's a beautiful experiment. I don't have the, 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 the reference here, but uh, um, if you drop me an email, I can, I can extend it to you. <laughs> sure, uh, Marina can, can, can do that. And uh, yeah, uh, for sure, I mean, Adriana will, will, uh, will answer her. Chat. Okay, there, there is a couple more questions. If, if you have a still a strength to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. I am, I am. I don't know about the, the, the people. <laughs> Can you and the organizers. <laughs> Zach asks again, uh, can you please comment on imaginary part of spin mixing conductance? Oh, what, uh, what does he mean? I mean, I don't know. What um imaginary part well, of then, the then yeah if we, as i can't help you just directly we can give uh, we can go to the other question and see if uh, if, if he uh, can elaborate more yeah, yeah because i, I mean for if, the for if, the if you elaborate the question we can we can go on again yeah, okay, yeah jose yeah. solano asks also is it possible to probe the dynamic magnetization angle as a function of thickness in metallic ferromagnetic samples with, with thickness of tens of nanometers with dynamic XMCD? It yeah. would be possible to measure the entire mode profiles across the thickness by example, yeah. Yeah, identifying pinning at interfaces? Wow. Well, the, one thing. One thing that I didn't have time to elaborate, but uh, maybe uh -huh. his question uh, is uh, maybe yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, allow me to go. I think she's a, 
Yeah. I think Jose is asking about that, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, it's super nice because um, he's asking about the um, probing or like um, um, analyzing the dynamic signal uh, in a selective way uh, of different modes that we can see in, in fMR. So what happens in, 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 uh, in, um, in a vector network analyzer uh, fMR or, or in, uh, for, for, for complex systems is that we can have, uh, we, we, we end up with a series of modes and sometimes we want to analyze them in a, or to, to explore what happens or what's what's going on um, in a selective way in these in these, these modes um, and we I mean with these um, microscopic techniques of uh, VNA fMR where we have everything mixed uh, together we cannot do it in a selective way so one way and one technique that has been uh, developed in the in the past years I mean in the in, I mean very recently is this uh, what is called a diffractive fMR in which we can access, uh, we can have uh, this mode resolution. So what it does is that it's also using uh, synchrotron radiation uh, techniques. In, uh, in this case, the technique that it uses is uh, what we call um, diffraction uh, soft X-ray uh, resonance uh, a scattering uh, resonant uh, uh, depression uh, in the subtex rates. Okay, so what we do in this case is that you you place your sample uh, in also in a coplanar waveguide, and then you um, shine the sample with the with the with soft X rays to have access not only onto the um, structural. Uh, uh, peaks uh, for for the diffraction conditions, but also on the magnetic peaks uh, because uh, you're 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 shining your sample with. I mean, you're, yeah, you're using uh, X rays or soft X rays that are uh, that allow you to do so to to, to study uh, magnetic peaks. And then uh, what they did uh, in this uh, in this work that you can you can find the, the reference here is that they use this this uh, this uh, system this uh, Y-type hexaparite um, to study. I mean, that, that in DNA fMR, it shows this, this complex uh, behavior, uh, several modes that they call mode A and mode B. Um, by tuning the energy and geometry and the, um, and the I mean, to, to nicely uh, um, uh, uh, perform this experiment, they tune these conditions, resonant, resonant conditions, to to extract information in a element selective way and mode uh, selective way for for understanding uh, what's going on at each of these modes. So yeah, if you want more information about this, uh, here's the here's the the um, the reference. And this experiment was performed in diamond light source, but I think they are in trying to implement it in some other, in some other. That's a um, great yeah. example of the capabilities of uh, synchrotron radiation, always to mix diffraction and spectroscopy in a single experiment, isn't it? It's yeah, very, excellent. Very, yeah, yeah. very, yeah. very nice. Plus doing ferromagnetic resonance. It's yes. really, really <laughs> it's a combination of the Yeah, things. it's a full combination. Raul Gupta asks you about uh, the possibility to measure the two magnon scattering contribution in line with using XFMR. Uh, right. I think he did this question on Monday, and not with XFMR, but to, to another speaker. Um, and well, we have tried to understand that, but um, I mean, to, to understand or to, to disentangle these. Uh, these um, contributions to damping mm -hmm. as well, but um, we would need to think about it. But I mean, right now I don't have an answer of how to do that with XFMR, unfortunately. And we were also thinking about it, but perhaps uh, in the future we could we could think on some some combination of some some uh, some uh, like smart way to to do so. Or, I mean, to to make use of the capabilities of these uh, element selectivity and, and also say, for example, mode selectivity uh, to, to extract or to disentangle 
more contributions to, to dumping in, in FMR. Mm -hmm. Good. And finally, Zach, uh, thanks you so much for the interesting talk and elaborate it on the previous question. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I'll go to the, the... The, the question is, can you please comment on imaginary part of a spin mixing conductance in ferromagnetic heavy metal bilayer configuration like permaloid platinum? Mm. Well, when we used, I mean, the, um, the easiest way to, to extract the spin mixing conductance uh, as we did uh, in, this, in this experiment was to do fMR measurements as a function of thickness uh, and then to, to, to extract, I mean, to model, to extract the, the damping parameters that are um, that come from the steam pumping uh, phenomena and then plot it against the layer thickness and then uh, you end up with the steam the mixing conductance this is what we did and then this can be done and has been done for for such by layers that 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 he's mentioning so this can be done i mean you can extract the that that parameter the steam mixing conductance that way and that's the easiest way and i would i mean if, uh, if he wants a suggestion, I, I suggest him to, to do so because it's, it's that would be a, a, an easy, uh, like let's say, or a first approximation to, to extract that parameter to, to understand uh, what's going on on the interface of this, of the bad layer uh, between a heavy metal and, 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 and a ferromagnet as we did in this case. So in this case, we, we did that for, for, in this case, it was a tri-layer, but actually what you do or what we model is for each of the interfaces between, for example, in this case, uh, nickel iron and uh, bismuth selenide and cobalt iron and bismuth selenide. So you extract spin mixing conductance for each of the interfaces. So it would be the same for, for, for his case. But uh, remember to do it so, uh, as a function of thickness because that's, that's the way you, you will end up with the, with the information. Okay, so... Thank you very much, Adriana, again. And uh, it has been a very nice uh, talk. And uh, and thank you to all the speakers of the of the session. This has been a long session, mm -hmm. but I hope very uh, productive and and really I, I think our our uh, registered participants have uh, really enjoyed the the, the talks. Uh, and uh, so uh, we can leave it here, thanking all the speakers again, and uh, see you all next um, Friday at uh, three o'clock Central European time. Thank you very much. Bye.